didn't time it. Uh, <laughs> Um, Dr. Sparks and I are from the Graduate School of Education down in West LA, and we are both reporting on um, an internal IT grant that we use to kickstart a new course in our doctoral program. And um, if you were here for the previous presentation, I just want to say I wholeheartedly endorse Open Ed and Creative Commons licenses. I think um, I don't see my, my interactions with students as intellectual property, and I'm very mellow about letting it out there into the world. Um, that said, we're going to now proceed. So we have a doctoral program in learning technologies. And that means that our students coming in have a fairly decent grasp of technology, but a lot of blind spots, as you've probably seen in freshmen, uh, where you think they're all digitally hip, and then you discover they're like using the space bar to center in Word or something crazy like that. So they all have blind spots, and programming is definitely one of them. Um, <coughs> I use this picture because this is someone who just solved a bug, a very happy person. Um, we came to this class uh, realizing the convergence of several trends in society at large and in education in particular. Um, this is an idea that actually started in the 90s, probably the 80s, if you count Seymour Papert's 1980 book. Um, where he was pushing for people to learn programming, and that's pre-web when you know we're talking about Apple IIs. Um, and I'm old; I go back that far. And uh, it's back, but it's different this time. Um, and there are some things here in the bullets that I would like to sort of highlight: um, the the rise of peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, beginning with Napster and and onward, uh, the ability for people to directly engage with each other and exchange material that they have either liberated or made themselves. Um, <coughs> sites like Etsy, Threadbare, eBay, where there's direct commerce between people, um, that's seen as part of a movement to sort of take back the web from the big companies that are, that are offering us um, free software on the front end and basically scraping big data off the back end and selling us. We're the product. Um, there's a fellow who says, if, um, if you're getting it for free, then you're not the audience. Look for who's paying the bills. And people paying the bills are the advertisers. So you're the, you're the product sold to the advertiser. Um, at the same time, we've seen an increase in hacker spaces and maker spaces and hackathons and maker fairs as more and more people, thanks to YouTube and other things, are starting to share their knowledge. I had to change a toilet thingy and I went to YouTube and there were like 6,000 videos of how to change the toilet flower. Um, so everybody, whatever, you know, when my husband asks the question, I send him to YouTube. At the same time, we're seeing technology coming down in cost and becoming more and more accessible to people. Um, Radio Shack, which used to be kind of like the geek place nobody actually really went to, um, now um, you find people in there pulling out material that they're going to use to do some project on the weekend. 3D printing um, is now pretty affordable. We had a guest speaker in our class last month who was um, working with educational districts, uh, obviously educational districts, uh, with 3D printing. Printers are $1,000 and under. Um, so desktop fabricating is, in this era, what desktop publishing was in the 90s, where suddenly there were no secretarial pools. You know, you could just put stuff out from your own desktop. And the third, or I guess fifth thing, is the rise of uh, the API and third-party modding and the Apple Store, which is another peer-to-peer -peer direct sale kind of thing, or the Google Play. Um, the, there's more space in the commercial venue for people to make stuff, just plain old normal people to make stuff. Um, and we thought, okay, if we've got a learning technology software program, our guys had better get their hands dirty uh, with this stuff. They should know about it. And at the same time, we've got socio-political context. We've got, you know, the STEM crisis. Oh my God, STEM crisis. Um, where all the federal research money is pushed towards STEM. You can be watching football, and an ad comes on telling you, oh, connect a million minds. Time Warner is worried about girls and computer science. And you're thinking, really? Um, so this has created an, another sort of emphasis uh, that, that I think all these sort of dovetail with the DIY maker opportunities. And we wanted to put together a workshop-y class where people would do these sorts of things and we could talk about some of the issues that I'm not talking about that are behind these um, 
these topics. So we applied for an IT grant. Now what makes this especially tricky is we have a hybrid program. Our students are predominantly online. They meet face to face twice a semester. Um, and we were about to tackle electronics and programming hybrid. <laughs> so interesting. Um, when we put together the grant, one of the things that was important to me was finding a background, a, a, a reason for this. A, a, you know, it's a doctoral program. We want to have a theoretical proposition behind it. And I looked at a lot of the uh, work that's being put out, both from organizations like ACM, which is the Computer Science Weasels, and then people in, in the K-12, ISTE, you know, technology for educators. Uh, and they're working together, but they're still pretty scattered in their definitions. When I poured through the literature, this seemed to be at least a list of things people agreed on. They had other things that they didn't all agree on, but these were the sort of the basics. I won't insult you by reading it, but you can see as you go through this list, it doesn't necessarily sound like it's only going to happen in programming. And in fact, the ISTE, uh, International Society for Technology, Technology and Education, education. their um, argument is that, and, and uh, Wing, the, this comp sci person who wrote the, one of the big articles on this, their argument is that this is stuff that you can find in social science and English lit. Um, one of our students in the course is from the journalism school up here, and she said, oh, I totally see this. This is definitely a piece of journalism. Um, we, we go through these things as well. So the idea behind computational thinking is a sort of being pushed as the next literacy. Um, now I'm going to let Dr. Sparks tell you about what we did. Thank you. Um, just briefly, my uh, first introduction with uh, computational thinking was back in high school. I was a brand new high school teacher, Whittier High School. Home of Richard Nixon and Back to the Future was home there. <laughs> just outside the computer lab, by the way. Uh, and I, I learned some very important things there in, in computational thinking. We, we were tasked, uh, some of us uh, bright-eyed uh, new teachers there, with putting together the computer literacy test for the district. They wanted everyone to be computer literate. And so we put together a, a very nice test, which included computational thinking and some programming ideas, right? Uh, well, they kept sending this back, and it started to uh, occur to me that uh, the, the message was the test was way too hard. They didn't want computational thinking in there at all. And uh, so I learned how to get off of a committee. <laughs> uh, when I realized that, I said, you know what? Uh, it's obvious that we, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the rigor here is, is not wanted. So why don't we just put a, a, a dead cat, a computer on, on Tables will just file the whole school through, and if they can point at the computer, <laughs> that's their computer. <laughs> that's a good way to get off the committee. So, computational thinking, that's, that was 30 years ago, right? We were talking about this is something that really needs to be there for kids to learn how to talk to mach machines. I teach a class in our program on uh, new media literacy. And, and what that means. And there are, there are people who believe that machines will take over within the next 10 years, right? And so I keep waiting for that year when I switch over from teaching people how to use technology effectively for training and education to, uh, to teaching them how to rage against the machine that's <laughs> taken over. So someone's going to need to know how these machines think, right? The computational thinking. So what we did and, uh, uh, is, is we tried to get out ahead of the game um, and, and brought in a, uh, a trainer, uh, uh, David Wolber, in the summer of 2013, and he held a class. Uh, faculty were there, as well as other students uh, looking ahead to uh, get a handle on this before we, we held the class in the fall. Uh, we collected resources, uh, tablets were purchased, and Arduino kits, uh, which became a, a lab cost. And so there, there were lots of moving parts here. Uh, this all includes, you know, getting things uh, registered with the, uh, the IT folks and, and all of that too. Uh, we arranged for discounts for vendors. So, um, so the students actually had to, to pay for uh, some of this out of pocket. Um, 
Linda had great contact with a TA who, who was the, uh, the magic sauce in this whole process because she, she knew about the, the uh, maker spaces and, and, uh, and the projects as well. And, uh, and she was very, very helpful in setting all of this up. Then of course there was the setting up the Sakai course. Uh, we were team teaching. Uh, Linda was gonna uh, start out first with uh, building microcontroller projects with the Arduino boards. And then I led the second half of the course with uh, having students build apps. So in the future, or I mean in the past, we had tried, uh, I, I had tried in another class to have students build apps and it, it didn't go well. And to ask them to do both of these projects in one semester, I think was, was really <laughs> stepping out there. Um, but we found, uh, on, on here's the, uh, Here's our trusty subjects here. This is cadre 18. Yeah. And uh, you see all their smiling faces. Uh, and you see the one cheese head there. <laughs> I'll show a project that he created here a little bit later. So they're smiling here, but they weren't smiling during the in entire process, as it was uh, a fairly uh, <coughs> adventurous and uh, uh, and difficult thing we were asking them to do. So we provisioned a basic lab kit for Arduinos, uh, Galaxy tablets for App Inventor, pre-assessment of, uh, we pre-assessed student skills and attitudes about computational thinking, debugging exercises. Uh, we, uh, this was mostly the TA had created, um, just describe briefly, there are, uh, sewing kits with electronics. You've, you've seen clothes that light up in different ways, right? Based on what you do and buttons that you push. So she actually created uh, debugging exercises with these to say, all right, here's, here's this project that's gone awry. You have to debug it and find out what's, what's wrong, what, what connection is not uh, happening. Uh, we created uh, wiki support online and then uh, captured all of the discussions, the, uh, collaborative reference materials and artifacts um, so that we could uh, review those and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, look into what we were able to accomplish and then uh, had them also do a uh, final reflection paper to catch some of their uh, emotional re responses to, to the projects. And I'll turn it back okay. over to Linda to she can show you what they did with the uh, microcontroller projects. Okay, I did link these because I didn't know how it was going to go. So, um, I'm going to show you three quick ones. One of the things we asked them to do was to turn in videos of their work. Um, and I believe, yes, Amy Cameron. So, um, the three are very different. One is just, an, for lack of a better term, like normal person, you know, no <laughs> hardcore computer skills. Um, and for those people, I think uh, the experience was most profound because they went from sort of great anxiety to increased confidence. The person on the front that was going like this is a high school AP English teacher. So there you go. Um, so here's, here's her project. And then I 
also have a light in front that can lead the way and so we won't trip and fall if we encounter a sidewalk that may be uneven. But the nice, real nice part is when I'm crossing the street, I just push my little switch here and my lights will flash. I'm signaling a car that's coming across the street that we're coming. I also put some LED lights on my dog's leash and so people will see her also. So this was my project and I'm real excited to go for a walk. Come on Zoe, let's go. space and visit it and engage with people there. Fortunately for Michaela, she found a space full of geeks and when she hit problems in her project, she was able to go back to the maker space and find support there. And one of the things we've been emphasizing throughout the whole program but also in this course is that people don't learn alone. People learn in communities with other people who have more and less expertise than their own and we encourage them very much to reach out and to engage and to sort of think about learning as a social process. So here's Michaela working on the lunch count for her classroom. discovered that one piece of paper was thick enough to bypass the borders of the FSR and register pressure on the FSR strip. However, now the magnet became too strong and applied too much force to the FSR strip. The FSR can only register around a few hundred ohms and one magnet took up about a third of the maximum ohms that I could use. So I went back to the drawing board and I tried different materials again. I found a perfect mix of one piece of paper covering the small paper square on the magnet and a piece of felt glued over that. I have found my perfect magnet. When I place the magnet on the board, it registers just enough pressure to leave room for nine more magnets to be placed on the strip. Each magnet is calibrated so that as a magnet is placed on the board, an LED will light up. I want to demonstrate how the FSR does not register a magnet without the small piece of paper stuck to it. The LED does not light up. On the other side of the magnet is the small square piece of paper underneath the paper and the felt. Watch how the FSR senses the pressure of the magnet. Here you can see the sensor data from the magnets being displayed on Arduino's serial monitor. The Arduino was coded so that a number of LEDs will light up depending on the pressure placed on the FSR. Now for the demonstration. As I place magnets on the board, a corresponding amount of LEDs will light up.
Now for the real test. What do my hot lunch tally volunteers think about the project? It looks like they're really happy about it. Success. Thank you. All right, so my last one is Rick, who had probably the most involved uh, um, project. He created a car seat that would text message you on your phone if you left a child in the car. That's well, just, those of you who know what's involved, just think about that. Okay, here's Rick wrapping it down. I have it in two parts because he goes on for a bit and I wanted to cut it up. Okay, everyone, so here is the finished product, project. Um, not quite assembled, but I wanted to give you a picture of what's inside. So I got this little pro, pro, um, project enclosure. Um, I've got the Arduino lily pad in there. Uh, I've got uh, a burner cell phone that um, I set up, um, and there's, so all the LEDs here are connected uh, to the lily pad, and they go up to the top of the car seat. Um, these two wires here go underneath the car seat, and I'll show you where they connect uh, later on. And then this last cable down here uh, is a USB cable that uh, gets connected to the car, and I'll show you where that plugs in. Um, and yeah, so those two cables on the bottom, they come around here. I've sewed them, I've sewed them through the strapping here and connected them That's here. So there's a thread. little magnet on that one, and there's just loops of thread on that one, and it runs back through the bottom there. Um, and when it's when the seat belt's connected, that creates uh, a circuit that tells the lily pad that um, the buckles are are connected. All right, let's put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, when you buckle the car seat, there are. There are some loops of the thread on that side, and there is a magnet on that side that connects, and that sends the signal through the seat belt back to the enclosure. And when you buckle it, it gives a little indication that it's buckled. And when you unbuckle it, it says that it's unbuckled. And so I'm going to buckle it up and I'll turn the car off. And there you go. I'll turn the car off. And you can see when the car goes off, then the lights start flashing. And hopefully that gets your attention. Uh, but if it doesn't get your attention, and you go about your merry way and do the things that you need to do. There you go. So there's the text message that says, there's a child in the car seat, better take care of that. And uh, there you go. So we should get a couple more, but I won't make you sit here and wait for it. So there you go. If the child is left in the car seat for longer, then uh, more text messages come and uh, they get more and more panicked and um, <laughs> and demand your attention. They come about every five minutes and uh, they'll keep running until the lily pad is out of battery or until the phone runs out of um, its uh, airtime credit or, uh, or the seat's unbuckled or the car's turned back on. There you go. Okay, so what you couldn't see in this were all the problems. So massive amounts of iteration, massive amounts of burning things out, um, we had one face-to-face -face class where it was like sort of soldering and sewing day. Um, 
a lot, and you could probably anticipate that, you know, for some of the guys, it was the first time they sewed, um, and that's conductive thread, so it carries current. Um, for the for some of the women, it was the first time they soldered, so everybody helped everybody. Um, it was a wonderful experience, and everyone got their project done, with one exception that was extremely complex, and we got most of the way there. Um, so back we go. And, oh. and, and keep in mind, these are uh, projects that are very meaningful to, right, they got to pick their own projects, and, and that's, that's a key. Uh, in a typical classroom, you, you sometimes make assignments, and uh, uh, in the case of Rick, he has like four or five kids, I think, something like that. So very meaningful for him. You sign that uh, project to somebody else, they're not going to have the, the interest to, to carry through. Um, on, on the App Inventor, we, we spent some time thinking about what, um, and, and what they would like to do, and one, one idea that actually came up that I remember has, has been done in the meantime, uh, but uh, I, I uh, encourage students not to do that. There's a, a new product out there called Pavlock, and Pavlock keeps track of your GPS location, and if you go too close to the refrigerator and you've programmed it, it will shock you. <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember that uh, that idea coming up, and, and we uh, we encouraged the students to, to move on to a, a, another project. Uh, oops, I gotta go this way. Mine are uh, located online. So here are a few uh, applications. Now, I realize, I think we also ought to point out, you might be thinking that our students, uh, you know, came from some technical school and have been soldering and doing this their whole lives. It's, that is not true at all. Uh, these are your typical education students, right? It's uh, Graduate School of Education and Psychology. And, and we do have some more geeky students who have spent time uh, with uh, more time with their computers than maybe the, the kids down the street, but these are by no stretch of the imagination are, had they had the experience of, of, of all the soldering and, and programming. We had one or two programmers who helped out a lot with the others, uh, but for all practical purposes, these folks had not programmed before, and in a half of a semester put together a, an application. So um, I preface that in in, in wanting to say that these are simple apps, but there's a, a lot involved and, and a huge leap in, in computational thinking to be able to tell the computer what you want it to do. All right, here we go. So here's one uh, from Bertha, who would always forget to water her orchids. And she created an app that would help with that. Hello. I want to talk to you guys about Water My Orchid, which is an app I created in order to save this beautiful orchid, which I got two weeks ago. So I always had problems watering my orchid um, because I overwatered it, so I decided to create this app to remind me um, not to water it and to water it at certain intervals. So the app that I created, um, you can see this little cute icon right there, is called Water My Orchid. Um, when I click on Water My Orchid, it will take me to my main screen, which has um, two options. You can either go to a tips and tricks screen or you can go to a watering reminder screen. The watering reminder screen, well, let's start with the tips and tricks screen. When I click on that, it'll take me to a subsequent page where it gives me maintenance tips on orchids. So for example, what should my ambient temperature be? Um, or how often should I feed my orchid? Or how often should I water my orchid? All right, and then the option to go back to the main menu. The second um, part of the main menu is I can set up a watering reminder. So in this case, what happens here is I've got my current time set up um, and my alarm time will go on the bottom. Got some suggested interval watering times. The user would then enter a time in here. So let's put point eight minutes, click on done, set the watering reminder. The alarm would then go off after the amount allocated set off has come in. So 
So the bad part about this app is that the app does have to continue running in the background um, or else it will reset the time. So hopefully in the next version of the app or if App Inventor at some point decides to support push notifications, I can redo the app so that the app does not have to be running in, this, in the background. Um, but this is it for prototype number one. Thank you for watching. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it's it, it, and the her, her feelings about the whole thing is this. I uh, finally got this crazy project done. It's she's thinking about how to improve it going forward. Okay, to me. Okay. Oh, sorry. Did I put the uh, the, the PowerPoint away? Didn't I? of time and I'm getting to skip to the, the end one here. This was Joy the fellow with the cheese on his head. This, this video shows the App Inventor project for EDLT 740. One of these things is not like the other. He homestools his kid. One of these things is not like the other. In this app, the user will try to pick one of the choices that is different than all the rest and pick the correct pink button and level up and go through different sequences of problems that have to do with JavaScript. On this first problem, level one, the problems all have to do with length and one of the uh, things about length in JavaScript is the spaces count as well, so D is the correct answer. So if you pick A, that's wrong. B is wrong too. And then here's the right answer, D. I'm not sure why he trolls the, the evil twins for his feedback, but you can, you can see that this is not trivial, right? This is a a fully functioning uh, a, a program to or application that will help people uh, see patterns and so let's go back um, we want to second tab. to the second tab here I'll get you back to the right spot. We're going to go. Yeah, we're going to whip through it so you can Q and A us. What we learned. Oh, oh. yeah, here's a, a few pictures of the process there. And then also, oh boy. There. Right. I'll let you take over. I'll let them take over. Um, let's see. Um, what we learned. All right there. What we learned. Um, Given that they're doing their own projects, they're uh, pretty invested, and that investment carries them through the tough patches pretty well. Um, we also did a lot of uh, what we consider to be identity work. Students at the end felt less like uh, outside novices and more like beginners, legitimate beginners. Um, uh, send me an email. <laughs> um, what they learned. So we went, went back and looked at the skills from the original list. And the two grayed out ones, I don't feel we have a lot of strength of evidence for, but people only had seven weeks to do each half, which, you know, for novices, that was a lot. So this semester, we're doing the class again. They're doing just the Arduino for the whole stretch of the semester, and already I think we're gonna get better results, so it might be that we needed that. Um, we got all, we hit all the dispositions. Um, that, was, that was nice. Um, assessment strategies. We've, the project videos are good, but they don't reveal as much. We were in Sakai, and we've got forums, and you can just see the heavy-duty discussion there. Uh, for research purposes, that's codable data. Um, we also had them keep design books. Uh, that's important because at the beginning, they all want to they all want to create like this thirty thousand dollar project, and then reality sets in, and they're down to like the three thousand dollar project, and then they're like, 
okay, so I can probably do this for 30 bucks and accomplish it. But there's a lot of scaling down and iterating as they sort of find the sweet spot of their talent and what, what's possible. Um, here's a student reflection, and I think that's what we're going to leave you with. I think the next one is Q&A. Um, and you can see that uh, they, they really, really had an impact on them. Yeah, I, identity shifts, right, from... Yeah. Yikes, this is impossible, what are you trying to get us to do, to being fully empowered and it's like, oh, I could do this and I'm, I'm going to continue. This was uh, actually fun and and I'm, I'm going to continue. I think Rick was pursuing uh, a meeting with people on, on his uh, baby seat project, right, in, for the car. So that is it. Uh, questions? Yes. I'm going to display my ignorance. Can you tell me what Arduino does? Oh, it's um, it's a little microprocessor uh, on a wafer, or in, in some cases on a pliable material, kind of like a mesh. It can be attached. I wonder if I have any pictures of it. Do we have any pictures of Arduinos? Um, it, in, inside computers, you, you've seen the. Uh, that's an Arduino right there, yeah, and yeah. it's got uh, ports that you that have. Uh, um, that are addressable through programming. So you can send signals out along uh, thread or wire or copper tape or pretty much any conductive entity um, to make things happen on the other end. And we asked students to have a state switch in their project. It had to be responsive to input. It had to be, it had to work. <laughs> and it had to be as elegant as they could make it. Uh, there were sort of quote, air quotes around elegant. So any, any little smart toys, if you tear them apart, you'll find a little, a little bit of circuit board in there, which, which will take input and, and then turn the eyes on, or if they make the arms move, that sort of thing. That sort of. And you can buy sensors. You can buy LED lights. You can buy um, time and motion. Um, what else? Lots of different sensors. I'm working on one this semester with a GPS. Oh, really? Yeah, track the cat. <laughs> if, if everyone has one in their uh, sprinkler controller outside in, in the yard, right? So at a certain time, then we turn on this sprinkler, and then later on we turn on that sprinkler. And, and uh, many of the controllers nowadays have a, mo a moisture sensor. Mm -hmm. So if it's rained in the last the few days, sensor. or temperature yeah. sensor. So that's the sort of thing that, that they're dealing with. But you can use that in all different ways to build toys. One student pulled apart a Hallmark card where you yeah. could record your greeting and use a little chip behind the picture to make a talking teddy bear. <laughs> so that was pretty good. I wouldn't have thought of that. Right. Yes. When do they take this course? They take it fall of year two. And it's called um, no, well, what is it called? We, we wanted to call it like DIY Maker Workshop, but we sort of got the kibosh on that. So uh, we called it uh, Applied Seminar and Advanced yeah, Technologies. Or, I had to get through UAC. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of technical knowledge you guys are communicating. How do you scaffold that? information or do they have that knowledge when they walk into the class because that's a lot of information to communicate on. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you're able to communicate all that all that information to the students in a 14-week course or 7-week course. There's a the student in the back. Yep. <laughs> Victoria? Victoria, we're sitting right behind you, uh, actually endured this process. <laughs> so we, we talked about the fact that there was a lot of tacit knowledge required in in different ways, and depending on how much we can to it, it was distributed throughout the course. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, and so, like they mentioned, we were encouraged, in fact, a requirement of the course was to find a maker community or a hack space that we had locally. And so, so we, we all did that, and depending on the knowledge that we had, a lot of us took advantage of those spaces. And so going out and meeting with those people we did a lot of that and that helped to bridge the tacit knowledge that we didn't have and YouTube was our friend. So 
that as well as just working with peers as we went through. Rick was one of the videos that we um, saw, and so as his learning curve increased, we would go to Rick a lot, and you know that that was how we kind of bridged the gap throughout the course was our community and our peers and YouTube. They also posted up, when they solved uh, particularly tricky sections of code, they would post code in, in the wiki and comment on it and explain sort of what, what they got past. So people could borrow, and we encouraged them, you know, good programmers borrow other programmers' stuff. So we encouraged them to sort of share, and there was a lot of that in the wiki. And, and in the program, we've long since gotten past the idea that we have to present them with all the information that they're going to need to solve the problem, right? That, that's what the World Wide Web and, uh, and other, um, other social connections are for. So it's really more a matter of you know, challenge and inspiring. And I, I was actually quite amazed that, uh, uh, at the projects and, and what, what they were able to accomplish. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, this shows my particular bent on, on uh, education or supporting. I'm, I'm less a fan of education, more a fan of supporting learning. So it's about supporting learning. I, I think in some ways we were, uh, we, we tried to get out ahead of it and, and, and plan for uh, situations, but, but you just can't. There's too many. And so you basically have to rely on the... Um, the capabilities of everybody involved, and you, and you solve these things as a community, and and that's that's a, a much bigger, more important lesson, if you ask me. At one of the face-to-faces, -face, a number of students commented how how cool it felt, because everybody. I took on a project too. I think it's important for instructors to have an ongoing project as well, to experience the same frustrations and and share and try and figure things out, and it just felt like this weird quilting bee thing. I mean, we were all just like hanging out. There, you saw in the first picture there were people had food and people were sewing and ripping and soldering and it was just, they had a good feel. Didn't they have a good feel to it, that first face-to-face? Yeah, face? awesome feel. Well, I mean, I should say, because of it, I mean, by the end, you end up learning and doing things that you never would have imagined. I mean, like, I mixed conductive paint through YouTube videos because, you know, trying to solve This was part of a grant, yes? IT grant. I'm IT a grant and a course. So I'm wondering if you both can talk about kind of like the internal structural issues some, that you may have run into. Because oftentimes we're ahead of, okay. and thinking ahead of how our students can go out and think outside the box. And then when we get there as faculty, we often find like, oh, we didn't think about all the parameters in helping support our students in that way. So I wonder if you can kind of just shed a little bit of light around that. Well, I have to confess, I didn't want soldering to happen because I had visions of <laughs> <laughs> lawsuits. <laughs> um, but they, when I refused to bring my soldering gun in, someone else brought theirs. Um, so <laughs> anticipating some of the things like that, um, I suppose, and this year I didn't even think to send out any kind of permission, you know, I hereby swear it's okay if I burn myself. Um, I didn't do that. But um, as far as logistics go, the main issues we had around, around the whole experience initially um, was around the money, was around the limitations on, on what faculty can do without going through channels. Sorry to go there, folks, but um, so there was a lot of I'd get information, pass it to the next guy, he'd pass it to the guy with the credit card, he'd get the thing ordered, and then we'd have to wonder where it went. Shortly before uh, one of the handouts of equipment, we couldn't find the equipment. It was like MIA, it was in Malibu mailroom or somewhere. So there's all that logistical stuff that has to happen. Um, I don't know, I didn't have too many other problems. We, we, you know, we got the Galaxy tab, and we had a back and forth. The person in Malibu we were working with was fabulous because we had to return some stuff and get different stuff. 
Um, and Amazon was wonderful to work with, and we cut a deal with the Spark Fund guys to give our students a cost break. Because uh, what happens is we, we set out, you know, as an instructor, you think you know what you're doing, and you set out a thing, and you've got sort of a sense of the parameters, and then all, all the cats wander off. And um, people were, were imagining projects that needed a lot of external material that we hadn't anticipated, but you couldn't buy a class set because everybody wasn't going to do the same thing. So what we have learned to tell our students this time is we're going to give you the core, but there's going to be out of pocket. And some people really went out of pocket. They, they got into it and they were like hanging out in Radio Shack all the time. And that was wonderful, but it was unanticipated. And then there was a little bit of, well, I don't know it's going to cost that much. And we're like, well, you didn't have to do that. We didn't want to kill the spirit, but so there's, so this year, what we did was we, for the Arduino piece, we made a smaller core kit and we and took out stuff that not everybody used and numbered it and it gets checked out to them and then they turn it back in um, and they buy the rest. So we sort of split the difference with the students so they could get a little bit more support and we could spend um, a reasonable, reusable kind of material. Um, what else? Uh, there is. The, I think you're also maybe inferring that and I think it's true in our case, these are not the normal order of business, right? So, so when you're talking with the uh, budgeting people and the, the procurement people, it's, it's not like they do this every day. And so th there is some resistance there for sure. But um, it, it wasn't well. unmanageable. It, it just takes a little extra pushing. And you have to trust your students. You know, they've got the materials they're going to have to turn back in. Or they're going to flunk. So we check them out, we take them back. Um, people blow things, you have to buy another one. Sometimes stuff's not totally reusable. So, we have fun though. So, we, we hope you've encouraged you to go out and do your own Arduino and projects and build your own apps. <laughs> or to just uh, let your students do stuff and trust that you can help them find the resources to get it to completion. Yeah, I, it, that's, that's the real key point for our presentation. I was. I was being facetious, <laughs> but it, but it is a lot of fun. In, in case you ever get the uh, the hankering, go for it, and and, and you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. Or, or let your uh, kids or grandkids help you out in that process. There you go. Thank you.